Hello, and welcome to Pan Can Pancreatic Cancer Action Network's webinar, Navigating Pancreatic Cancer Care During the Coronavirus Crisis. This is the third session of the webinar series about the coronavirus. Today's presentation is scheduled for 60 minutes, which includes time for questions. The questions that are more relevant to today's topic and more general in nature will be prioritized. A recording of this presentation and the slides will be available under the educational events page at pancan.org. I would now like to hand off the presentation to PanCan's president and CEO, Julie Fleshman. Julie, you have the floor. Great. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you today virtually. And first of all, I just hope that everyone is doing well and staying safe during these unprecedented times. So before we get started, I want to um, acknowledge our uh, sponsors for this webinar, starting with our webinar, our leading sponsors, AstraZeneca and Ipsen, and also a special thank you to our scientific and medical affairs industry members, Abby, Angiodynamics, AstraZeneca, Ipsen, Janssen Oncology, Pfizer, Raphael Pharmaceuticals, Tempest, Trisolis, and Time. So I want to start by saying I hope that everybody knows that PanCan is open and available for you. Our patient central call center is open Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. Pacific time to 5 p.m. Pacific time. And we understand that this time is challenging for patients and families, and we want to make sure you know that our services are open and available for you. So I'm thrilled that we've been able to host this webinar series uh, about navigating pancreatic cancer during the coronavirus pandemic. We, this is our third webinar in the series, and if you missed the first two, you can find them on our website. Today, we've brought together two leading pancreatic cancer experts. I'm going to ask them some of the common questions that we've been hearing from patients and families. And then I'll ask all of you to submit any questions that you have through the Q&A panel on the, um, on the WebEx. We will try to get to as many of those questions at the end of our discussion today. I also want to note that our panelists are not experts in the coronavirus. They are experts in pancreatic cancer and will be answering the questions today based on their experience with treating pancreatic cancer. So it's my pleasure to introduce our two experts. Uh, Dr. Andrew, L Andrew Lowy is a surgeon. He's a professor of surgery and the clinical director for cancer surgery at Moore's Cancer Center at UC San Diego Health. He is also the chair of PanCan Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. Dr. Margaret Tempero is a medical oncologist, a professor of medicine and the director of the Pancreas Center at the University of California, San Francisco. She is the chair-elect for PanCan Scientific and Medical Advisory Board, and I'm so grateful to both of them for being with us on this call today. So let's get started. Dr. Tempero, I'm going to start with you. So can you talk a little bit about how this pandemic is specifically affecting care that you provide patients with pancreatic cancer? And you're on mute, Dr. Tempero. How's that? Perfect. Okay, sorry. Uh, you know, I can honestly say that we have not compromised anyone's care. I am confident about that. It was pretty tricky in the beginning trying to figure out, um, you know, how to, most of us had never done telemedicine before. We had to take a crash course in that. Uh, our nurses had to learn how to work from home and uh, doing the same sort of thing, communicating uh, but mostly by telephone. Uh, but we were able to keep everyone's chemotherapy um, pretty much on schedule. Uh, there were a few things that um, came up early on in the pandemic. There was a concern, a, a lot a concern about certain types of procedures, particularly um, endoscopies, which many of our patients need. And uh, there were safety concerns for the providers who were doing those procedures. 
But I, I think we've worked through most everything now, and I'm really proud that we've been able to uh, keep everybody on course. That's terrific. I know a lot of patients have questions about how many pancreatic cancer patients have been impacted by COVID-19, sort of what that risk looks like. Are you aware of any, you know, data that tells us um, those numbers and, you know, what, what that means for, for pancreatic cancer patients generally? You know, we've had, not just in our pancreas cancer patients, but all of our patients at UCSF, we've not had one cancer patient that's been infected, mm -hmm. that we're aware of. And so, uh, so while certainly the risk is there, there have been some published papers from China, from their experience there, suggesting that patients who are on chemotherapy have a higher risk and also can get more serious complications. But right. I, I must say that at least in our experience, it's been pretty minimal. Right, yeah, and anecdotally, I would say based on the conversations I've had with other you know, oncologists and surgeons, it seems to be a similar, similar answer, which I think um, probably is reassuring to, to patients. Um, Dr. Lowy, um, what has been the impact of the coronavirus specifically on pancreatic cancer surgeries? Well, uh, you know, similar to, you know, Margaret's experience, uh, fortunately, there hasn't been a, a big impact other than obviously changes in our workflow uh, in terms of uh, the requirement for testing uh, of patients and staff in the operating room. Uh, you know, we certainly did not delay anyone's pancreatic cancer surgery uh, during even at kind of the height of, of concerns about COVID. Uh, you know, we may have modified the treatment schedule for a few patients who are on preoperative treatment, perhaps to extend it a little bit. Um, but uh, really, other than that, we proceeded uh, business as usual as far as getting them the care they needed. Uh, you know, we have a protocol uh, at UC San Diego where every patient who's undergoing an operation, any operation, has to be tested for COVID-19 within 72 hours of their operation. All the operating room uh, personnel have been tested. And fortunately, you know, much uh, like the experience that Margaret uh, shared, you know, we have not had any asymptomatic patients who are going to the operating room test positive. And in our entire health system now of over uh, 8,000 people who've been tested, there have only been a handful, and by a handful, I mean about five people who are asymptomatic who tested positive. So I think it's very reassuring. What it tells us is that the measures we're taking uh, this, uh, to prevent the spread of COVID, social distancing, hand washing, masking, are very effective uh, if they're adhered to. Right, and do you have any advice for patients if their surgery has been canceled or delayed? Well, I think that uh, that should be uncommon, but uh, if, if it's being delayed because there is uh, an issue in their health system, you know, then really I'll have to work with their provider to understand, you know, uh, what the best path forward is if that you know, maybe if they're in a particular window where surgery really should be performed soon, it may be a situation where it should be done at another institution. Uh, you know, there are still some states where, where COVID uh, numbers are increasing and there are some restrictions. Uh, I know in Arizona, they're now restricting, uh, you know, certain types of surgeries. So uh, it really uh, would be incumbent on the care team to, to talk to the patient and uh, and understand what the best path forward is. And sometimes there's flexibility. You know, we, we vary the lengths of preoperative chemotherapy and radiotherapy for patients. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we can extend that uh, without, you know, any concern about, uh, about that being harmful. And sometimes it can even be very helpful. Uh, but really, it's understanding for each individual patient where they sit in the, you know, the course of their treatment plan. And Dr. Loy, what should a patient do if they start to have COVID-19 symptoms? 
Well, the most important thing to do is to get immediately in touch with your primary care physician uh, and to uh, essentially self-quarantine uh, until te arrangements for testing and, you know, an exam, if that's indicated, uh, can be made. That's, you know, and if you are under, obviously, if you're under active cancer care, to also let your cancer physicians know about your symptoms. Uh, because what we don't want is people who are symptomatic to uh, potentially, uh, you know, who could be carrying the virus to spread it to others. Uh, so we want to make sure they get the appropriate care and that they are isolated and prevented from spreading it to anyone else. Dr. Tempero, um, many patients, you know, are worried about getting COVID-19, but they still want to get the very best care for their pancreatic cancer. Um, what should patients do to just ensure they stay safe? Well, I think, um, you know, minimizing exposure. So uh, some of the things that Andy's already talked about, but, you know, when you're out in public, you you know, keeping your your distance of six feet, keeping your mask on, washing your frequently. Uh, we're all much better at this. I've been watching people at the sinks. <laughs> Everybody is doing this <laughs> the right way. So I think you know that this is this if this virus has taught us anything, it's got us doing better practices in general, which I think will be helpful for uh, minimizing the spread of all sorts of diseases. Um, but I think just uh, just think every time uh, about about what you're putting yourself in front of, touching and so on, and be sure that you're practicing everything the CDC tells you to do. Yep. Everybody's singing happy birthday now when they wash their hands. That's Make right. sure they're doing it long <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Tempro, are you using telemedicine at all? Is that something that you would recommend for patients over in-person visits? So telemedicine has its, certainly has its benefits. And um, I think it's a great thing that we've all converted to this, learned how to do it. It's very convenient for the patients. I do find that um, I, I, I feel that I'm missing something when I'm doing a visit by telemedicine. There's something very important to me about being in the presence of another person and uh, being able to talk with them, being able to reassure them, uh, being able to hold a hand, wipe a tear away if that's needed. So I don't particularly enjoy the two-dimensional part, but I see the value in it. And I think for many things, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be continue to be useful for perpetuity. Well, we're going to keep doing this, um, mm -hmm. keep people at home, uh, off the road, for example. Our traffic here in San Francisco is horrible, so, <laughs> so <laughs> just not having to fight traffic to come in and see your doctor. Um, those things are good, but I think there is a personal element that um, I'm always going to miss. Dr. Lowy, um, should patients get tested for COVID-19, even if they're not having symptoms, before they start treatment? So our protocol at UC San Diego is all patients who are going to start treatment do get tested. Uh, and so we do recommend that. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of data. Uh, it's not a, a really a data-driven thing at this point, frankly, but we just feel like it's sensible, especially since, uh, you know, and Margaret can better comment, but patients who are getting chemotherapy obviously can become immunosuppressed. Uh, and so the last thing you want to have is someone who's immunosuppressed, obviously, net, then getting sick from, from the virus. So we are actually testing really patients going on any cancer therapy, whether it be radiotherapy, whether it be uh, chemotherapy, and obviously I already talked about surgery. So, you know, that is our practice here, and I, I would guess is the practice or going to be the practice at most uh, places around the country. And it's obviously for the protection of the patient, but it's also for the protection of the care, the healthcare workers and everyone else who's in the building that you're going to be in, uh, including other patients and visitors and so forth. So, so this is all about protecting each other. Uh, it's really, you know, we're all obviously as we realize now more than ever, you know, codependent. And so uh, the more we assure 
At one person, each person is safe, the more we assure the safety of everyone. Great. So, you know, the country is reopening at different rates. Um, in California, of course, where you are, Dr. Lowy, um, we are slowly reopening. Um, have you seen any changes to patient care since the reopening process? It, well, I, I wouldn't say changes to patient care so much as clearly an increase in patients returning to the health system, uh, pa patients who had put off uh, aspects of care. Uh, so, you know, for instance, in terms of cancer, not so much in terms of treatment because we didn't really stop treatment, but patients who are under surveillance, for instance, uh, you know, for their pancreas cancer, uh, who we put off scans, things like that, where they, to, to keep them at home, we're now starting to return to those activities, uh, obviously with the appropriate, um, you know, preventative measures in place. Great. Dr. Tempero, what's happening with pancreatic cancer clinical trials right now with all of this going on? Well, fortunately, right now, everyone's opening up again. Uh, we didn't close our clinical trials, but we did pool to most of our trials uh, because there are many extra visits usually <laughs> required with a clinical trial and more personnel that need to interact with the patient. And so for safety, reasons, we really decided better to just stop accrual to most things. But now we're ramping up again. And I think that um, we've, we've thought through a lot of the uh, issues. So I think we're, we're doing a lot better at figuring out how to minimize exposure. And we're even able to do some consenting virtually now, mm -hmm. which we couldn't do before. So um, like everything else, we're learning new ways of uh, going about our business. And so I, I feel that patients will uh, have increasing access to clinical trials going forward, uh, even, right. if the, and, even if we have a surge again, because I think we understand how to manage it better. Yep. Yep. And some of the things like doing remote consenting is probably something people have been talking about for a long time but we were forced to sort of do it, um, and it's probably a, something that will be helpful to patients in the long term. I mean, good things do can come out of a crisis. Uh, so yeah. if, um, if we can figure out how to make, make, make sure, of course, that we're respecting you and all the other things that we need to uh, mm -hmm. be mindful, we can do things more uh, efficiently um, and less costly, uh, it'll be great. Yep, absolutely. Are you experiencing any issues with accessing investigational or experimental therapies? Not really. I mean, we've had, they were never taken away. We just realized we just stopped uh, enrolling onto the clinical trials. But, um, you know, I think there are, uh, there's going to be continued rollout of new studies. Uh, we're just, we have active discussions every week about what what we might be able to take on as we open up the trials that we already have. So I think everything should be available. And if patients are being told that there aren't clinical trials open right now because of the pandemic, again, do you have any advice for them? Well, I think right now they're, uh, if they can just sit tight a little bit, it's not going to be very long. So I don't think that they need to um, panic. Because, like I said, everyone is opening up their enrollment now, and there will be more studies coming on board, too. Dr. Lowy, are, so, you know, are we essentially just waiting now for a vaccine to be found before our lives can return to normal? Um, you know, are there any milestones um, that we should all be thinking about and looking for as, as we ease restrictions? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that clearly it's going to take either a vaccine or an effective therapy uh, to really change the game from where we are. Uh, you know, otherwise, it's pretty clear, you know, unfortunately, that the virus is not going away. Um, you know, if you really look critically at the numbers in the United States, the, the number of cases is going down place, some places, going up other places, but uh, really is kind of flat overall. 
So uh, I think it, you know, it's likely to be with us un until we have some effective tool to combat it. Um, really, the biggest milestones have been, you know, the early uh, vaccine trials, which have in very small numbers of patients, which have at least demonstrated people mounting an immune response, uh, you know, to the vaccine. Uh, the, you know, the first phase three trial, which is really the, you know, the very large, about 30,000 patients trials that are required to determine efficacy. Uh, the first one's going to start in July, and there's going to be two to follow quickly in the United States, probably one in August and one in September is currently uh, scheduled. And, you know, and I read the other day, there's over almost 130 vaccines in development worldwide. So there's no shortage of activity. Uh, and I, I think we hear less about novel therapeutics, uh, probably because those are a little bit further behind and more complex to develop, but I'm sure that that space is active as well. But yeah, to go to the, the real answer to your question is, yeah, we really are waiting for a vaccine or a therapy because that's the only way that, that we have to, uh, you know, combat the virus beyond what we're doing, which is just preventing its spread and managing it. Yeah, and I guess that goes back to the precautions that you talked yeah. about earlier and yeah, why those our, are just so important. Exactly. That's our weapon right now to, you know, to prevent this thing from getting out of hand and affecting us any more than it has. I don't think there's any doubt, though, that we'll have a vaccine. I don't think there's a, there will several of these products will become effective and be available for broad public use. So I'm very confident about that. Yeah, I think I think there's reason to be optimistic. Uh, I mean, there have been failed vaccine efforts. You know, obviously HIV is the perfect example. But that's a virus that mutates very rapidly, whereas all the evidence so far is that uh, this, this virus does not do that, which makes it much more likely uh, that a vaccine can be effective. So I agree with Margaret. I think the early data is encouraging. There are so many different efforts. There's never been this kind of an effort to make a vaccine in human history. And so um, yeah, I, th I think that uh, we'll be successful. It's just a matter of what the timing will be. Yep. Well, that's all. That feels good. So thank you. That I think that's good news for everyone to hear all, hear that. Um, Dr. Tempero, you talked about this a little bit already, but what are some of the lasting impacts that the pandemic's going to have on pancreatic cancer treatment? Well, I think we're uh, going forward. I think we're going to be. Um, more and more thoughtful, not that we haven't been thoughtful, but, you know, every time you think about um, the number of visits a, a treatment might entail or um, uh, the number of imaging studies that a patient might have to go through, I think we're going to be very careful that we're, we're ordering things that are only truly necessary, that we aren't putting people at, at risk. Uh, it's just going to be a little bit more... Um, how should I say, methodical, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and you know, because uh, we, we really have to be careful, and if it, this virus has taught us anything, it's that. Um, we have to be more thoughtful about what we do. Yep. Dr. Lowy, on the surgical side, do you see any long-lasting impact? Well, I, I think the big impact will be on, uh, you know, on how we follow patients. And I do think the telehealth, you know, uh, you know component will clearly be uh, a much more, uh, you know, key piece of our care patterns. Uh, because, you know, when we do follow up for patients, a lot of times, you know, it's mainly consisting of a blood test and an imaging study. And, you know, I have patients who live, you know, out in, in the desert in Palm Springs who will come two hours each way to see me really to discuss what their CAT scan results are. And, you know, really a lot of times that doesn't make a lot of sense uh, if you can do it by looking at somebody, you know, uh, on the computer and addressing every question they have. And if a physical exam is not a really important part of the visit, then I think for a lot of those patients, um, you know, telehealth will be hugely impactful. 
Uh, as Margaret said, I think that especially for new patients, especially when key decisions need to be made, difficult times in the setting of progression or recurrence and, you know, in-person visits, there's no substitute for it. But for the routine things that we hope will become ever more routine, we're seeing patients off therapy who are doing well, uh, hopefully they won't have to make the trek to our cancer centers quite as often, and I think that'll be good for everyone. Yep, absolutely. So I, this is a little less about the coronavirus, but I thought our attendees would appreciate hearing from both of you about, you know, what are the latest clinical advances in the field that you're excited about, starting, starting with you, Dr. Tempero? Well, I was very excited when the um, drug Olaparib was approved uh, not too long ago, and it was approved in the setting of uh, patients who are born with a, a mutation in the BRCA gene. Um, these patients can uh, respond to a new class of drug called PARP inhibitors, and that's what Olaparib is. It was approved to prolong the the um, response after uh, initial treatment. So it was basically a way of maintaining benefit that you would get from treatment for a longer period of time. And I was excited about that for two reasons. One, it's great to have a new drug for patients, but number two, it's, it's wonderful to think about how we might be able to maintain response after it's achieved. So rather than continuing on with chemotherapy and its attendant side effects, if we can uh, use a milder drug that would allow for this response to continue and perhaps have some added therapeutic benefit in addition, that would be really terrific. And it kind of opened up, I think, a lot of thoughts about how we could do that with other agents. Uh, so new promising agents and where we might be able to um, to use that same strategy. And how does a patient know if, a, if that particular drug um, or another tr targeted drug might be right for them? What kind of testing that do they need to have done? Well, we now recommend that all patients have what's called germline testing, so understand what whether they were born with a mutation that predisposed them to developing a certain cancer. And there are many reasons why you would want to do that, but it, 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 it can actually influence a choice of treatments that you might uh, elect. The other thing we want to do is do profiling on the tumor tissue because the tumor are mutations, and some of those mutations have, you, have unique aspects, and we have drugs for some of the, those mutations. Right now, uh, the, well, the biggest mutation important one is is called RAS, and we don't have any, haven't had any good drugs that target that particular mutation in the tumor, but uh, there are several types of, of mutations that can occur within the RAS mutation, and we now have one drug uh, that does target the G2P mutation in RAS. That's looking very promising in early clinical trials, and if that works and the the scientists who develop these drugs can continue <laughs> to uh, work on that theme, we may have a whole slew of anti-RAS drugs going forward. That would be very exciting. It would be. <laughs> Dr. Lowy, what about you? What clinical advances are you excited about right now? Yeah, um, absolutely would echo what Margaret said. Um, I think the Olaparib story is really important for a lot of reasons, um, both the idea that uh, maintenance therapy can be effective. Um, whenever we have a success, it also, also points to the things we need to know more about because uh, while a lot of those patients did well, there were some patients with the same mutation who didn't have the same response. And so it kind of gives us a path forward in science to understand the disease better. So I always look at it kind of in, in two, two different ways, um, uh, I think, you know, positively. Um, clearly, RAS would be transformative if we can effectively target it. And then I think there's, there's a host of other new uh, directions, new therapies that are in trials or hopefully will be soon. Um, there was a recently reported trial called the COMBAT trial, which uh, looked at 
uh, targeting a protein called CXCR4, which uh, has been of interest for a long time. Actually, my lab uh, identified it in pancreatic cancer precursors a long time ago as, a, as an interesting uh, protein, and it was targeted with a drug uh, in combination with immunotherapy, and uh, the results were extremely encouraging. Uh, it was a relatively small study, but uh, the same kind of study we've done with a lot of other uh, potential immunotherapy approaches that have not worked. Uh, so this was encouraging, and we'll now move on to to a next phase. So, uh, so I think there's some uh, really you know excitement in the field that we may have something uh, to potentiate immunotherapy in pancreas cancer patients. Just the sheer number of other targets in the immune therapy space in pancreas cancer in early phase trials to me is exciting because I think we have multiple opportunities and avenues, uh, you know, that are being pursued on the basis of good science. Uh, there are, there is a very large uh, phase three study of a uh, drug targeting tumor metabolism, which will complete accrual, uh, you know, probably this summer. Uh, and we're excited to, lead, to hear if this is really going to work. Um, you know, one of PanCan's sponsors, you know, makes makes that drug, um, and so we're, uh, you know, that's another trial that will hopefully be giving us some results soon. And then I think the other area of, you know, intense interest that's that's newer is the microbiome, and uh, how the the bacteria of the gut and the bacteria and fungus that may live within pancreas cancers uh, may affect the disease biology and may be actionable, targetable for uh, therapy. So there are a large number of exciting areas um, which are in different phases, early phase and late phase um, trials uh, at this point. So I think a lot to be optimistic and excited about. Yeah, that's great. And lots of different approaches, which is yes. uh, good too. Absolutely. That yes. yeah, not, not all in one area. Right. That's terrific. So um, there are questions coming in, so I want to give us time to do Q&A. Um, all of our attendees, please feel free to submit a question through the Q&A panel. While everybody does that, uh, Dr. Lowy, why don't, can you just review some of these quick tips um, regarding how people can stay safe right now? Absolutely. Um, first and foremost, uh, as we talked about, it's important to stay connected to your healthcare team and to contact them immediately if you develop any symptoms. And as I said before, if you have symptoms, you really should self-quarantine until you've been tested or spoken to your healthcare providers. Uh, you, should, you can check the uh, U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the CDC uh, website for information updates. Those are updated frequently. Uh, it be, it's a good idea to have a plan uh, in case you or your caregiver were to get COVID, uh, how you're going to manage that. And so, obviously, uh, you know, planning ahead is always good in, in any aspect of life. We want you to stay home and limit your exposure, as Margaret talked about. Um, that's really the, the best way that you can stay safe. Uh, frequent hand washing, 20 seconds in duration at least, uh, and avoid touching your face. Uh, make sure that you're wearing a mask in public places. It helps protect you as well as others. And to follow those social distancing guidelines to stay six feet away from others when possible. Uh, you can get support through virtual counseling and online support groups. And I'm sure that PANCAN can help you coordinate those types of things as needed. And you can contact PANCAN for other additional tips or for any questions you may have. Great, thank you. We've got lots of good questions coming in here. So, um, Dr. Tempero, um, so people are really worried about their risk um, of COVID-19. This question in particular about pancreatic cancer survivors who are one, two, three plus years after treatment, are they still at a higher risk than the general population? Well, we don't know that for sure. But the general sense is that your risk is probably highest when you're on chemotherapy. Once you have um, completed your chemotherapy, you're off treatment, 
had surgery and you're not getting treatment anymore, you may not be at any higher risk than anybody else. Um, we know that older people um, can be, have more serious disease. Uh, we don't know that they are at any greater risk of getting it. So uh, age and um, uh, age seems to be the biggest factor and, and serious underlying immunosuppressive conditions seem to be the biggest factor in, in um, not, not just at risk, but in having serious disease. But we, I wouldn't think that there would be any reason that someone following their surgery, especially if they were years out, would have any greater risk than anybody else. Dr. Lowy, this question specifically about someone who had their um, spleen removed, and so they're concerned again um, about their immune system being compromised and their risk of COVID-19. Yeah, it's a good question. In general, uh, we tend to think of patients who have who are asplenic or don't have a spleen as really being uh, that the susceptibility really being related to bacterial infection uh, rather than viral infection. So um, there is no data, obviously, at this point. Uh, uh, and, you know, we certainly always urge people uh, who don't have a spleen to be in closer touch with their uh, care providers should they have a fever or infectious illness. But at this point, I don't think there's any uh, reason to surmise that they should be more susceptible to either getting COVID-19 or, uh, you know, getting over COVID-19. Dr. Tempero, um, caregivers are concerned about putting patients at risk. Um, this particular family, um, the mom has pancreatic cancer and she lives alone. And so her family wants to know, you know, what, what precautions do they need to take um, with their mom right now? What we generally advise is that um, that the patients remain kind of in isolation, which is hard, you know, um, it's hard to think about. Uh, and it is particularly difficult if a patient is near the end of life. Um, you know, we have at our hospital have uh, asked that there be no visitors. That's being loosened up just a little bit now. But um, basically, it's like everything else. Keep your distance, uh, uh, at least while we have so many active cases uh, uh, going on in, in the United States. So it's just best to, um, to not visit, uh, to on the telephone or do these video visits so that uh, you can see each other um, and, uh, and and all the other precautions that uh, that Andy mentioned when he went through the uh, uh, the list. Dr. Lowy, are there any additional steps a patient should take post Whipple procedure right now? No, it's really, you know, we keep, we keep saying the same thing over again, and that's because that's really what you have to do. Uh, you know, patients post-surgery clearly do have some immunosuppression. Uh, you know, it's not perhaps the same degree as when they're on chemotherapy, but there's clearly an immunosuppressive state to the post-operative state. And so, uh, you know, staying at home, uh, you know, masking, hand washing, all the same things, limiting your exposure to other people is really the ideal way to get recovered. And it can be hard uh, because we're telling you to walk a lot and be active, and yet, you know, you're kind of, uh, you're kind of constrained uh, in a way. But uh, it's, it is pretty clear that the risk of transmission outdoors is lower. And so, uh, you know, we, we do encourage patients, even if they're post-op, uh, that they can go outside, they can walk around their block. Uh, obviously, they should be masked but um, you don't have to stay confined to the house. Um, but being, you know, outside, on, you know, on the street is probably a lot safer than, you know, than being in a store, for instance, uh, near other people. So uh, just, you know, that is one additional thing to add. But, um, you know, all the tips that, that we encourage for everyone apply no matter where you are in the care trajectory. 
And so Dr. Kempro, another question similar, but obviously there's lots of fear from people. So probably if you keep repeating the same thing, it's, it's okay. Um, this this um, husband and wife have been quarantined since March because she is on chemo right now. He's wondering if it's possible for him to leave and go to the dentist or get a haircut. And you know, would that type of thing endanger his wife? Well, you know, the problem is when you go out and do those things, you may um, you may get exposed. Uh, um, I think we have to be really thoughtful about our what the Department of Health is saying. And I don't believe, for instance, right now that dental offices are opening up for routine procedures. And in only uh, in only certain states and certain places are the hair salons, for instance, or the barbershops opening up again. And if they do, you want to really check to be sure that they're following all the precautions that the health department is recommending. Um, I know these seem like they change from time to time, but that's probably because we're learning new things as we go. But I think that uh, everybody's got to be thoughtful about the fact that they might get exposed and bring it home. Dr. Lowy taking a little different turn here. Um, are there any patients um, who needed a gastric bypass who were then later able to have a Whipple procedure? Yes, I, that's not a contraindication. I've probably done half a dozen, and we actually published a series on this recently uh, to go over the technical aspects of the operation. Uh, we, it was a whole group of us across the country who put together about a 90-some-odd patient series that's now published uh, on uh, the technical aspects of surgery after gastric bypass. Great. Dr. Tempro, this question was specifically for you. Any stem cell updates? Any stems? Stem cell updates. Okay. Maybe someone you've talked to before about stem cells. Um, well, I'm not aware of any uh, stem cell trials in pancreatic cancer. Um, we are certainly interested in targeting uh, the cancer stem cells uh, that occur in tumors that are present in tumors and are often cause of therapy resistance. So, um, in fact, um, Andy and I are actually working on a project which um, it's has that kind of a target. So um, that's something that's a really active area of, of interest in research. And if one can identify these cells and selectively eliminate them, uh, one would think that you could eradicate a tumor. Great. Um. Dr. Tempro, again, a more general question. Um, what advice would you give to people who are considering clinical trials um, and, and to how to determine what the best option is for them? Well, we're thinking about it in the context of um, our current crisis with COVID. It would probably be wise to really make sure you understand what the required visits are and how often you would be, um, you know, risking an exposure in the clinical trial you're considering. Um, that, that to me would be the most important aspect. Okay, great. So I think we've gotten through um, all of the questions. Um, do you have any, I'll just maybe ask each of you any final words you can hear sort of people are fearful and, and, and you know, want to make sure their loved ones are safe and that they're not putting, you know, the patient in danger. Um, any, any final thoughts about that for people? Dr. Well, Kimbrough, start with you. Yeah, one thing that I would advise people about is, um, you know, when you do have to go into your healthcare facility for any reason, you should go with confidence because, uh, I've been so impressed at how hospitals are um, taking this so seriously, are um, watching over the healthcare providers as well as the patients. 
I've never felt like it's cleaner or safer to go in. <laughs> and I haven't been going in very much until recently. And when I do go in, I have to, I myself have to do my own health screening. I have to, um, they watch me sanitize my hands. They watch me put on a, a, a new mask. I take off the one I was wearing from home and put on a new one. Uh, everybody is really respectful inside the clinic. We don't sit together. We sit far apart. Uh, we talk to each other from six feet away. Uh, so we, we are doing everything I think that we're supposed to do to minimize the, the risk of the virus. So I think when patients do have to come in, they shouldn't be afraid. It's going to be safe. Great. Great. Dr. Lowy? Yeah, I would echo that, and I would just go one further where I say that aside from your home, it's probably the safest environment there is, and we can say that on the basis of actual data. A lot of the things we've talked about, we don't necessarily have data. Here, we do have data because we've tested our patients, we've tested our healthcare workers, and so we know the incidence in our institution, and it is incredibly low. So, uh, so really, you know, the point is that don't, uh, you know, delay getting health care uh, because of the fear of COVID because it's highly likely that whatever illness, uh, and certainly if it's cancer that you're dealing with, uh, is likely to be much more important and acutely dangerous than, than the risk of COVID uh, entering the healthcare care environment. Um, you know, I think, I think beyond that, uh, you know, just to, to stress that all of these measures that we have taken and are taking, they act, they work very well. Uh, and uh, they're not a treatment or a cure, but in terms of prevention, they are very, very effective. And so it's just about, you know, being adherent to them and, you know, not slacking off and, and just saying, oh, well, you know, I don't have to wear a mask today, or I don't have to, you know, wash my hands today, or just forget about doing it, it's something that you have to just, there's no room for kind of slipping up. You have to just make it part of your new lifestyle, you know, for the time being. Uh, and I think that uh, when these, you know, when these measures are adhered to, uh, you know, people uh, remain healthy, stay safe, and can attend to, you know, the most important things, uh, uh, obviously their cancer care is, is chief among those. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lilly and Dr. Tempero, for, for joining us today and for your expert advice. I think it's been very helpful um, for our attendees. Um, to all of our attendees, the PowerPoint slides and a recording of the webinar will be available on pancant.org under the educational events page by the end of this of, the, of next week. Um, so if you want to listen to this again, um, you can go there or you can also share it with, with family and friends. Um, once again, I just want to thank our webinar sponsors, AstraZeneca and Ipsen, and our scientific and medical affairs industry members, AbbVie, Angiodynamics, AstraZeneca, Ipsen, Janssen Oncology, Pfizer, Raphael Pharmaceuticals, Tempest, Trisolis, and Time. Um, so thank you, everyone, so much for your participation today. A survey will pop up once you leave this session today, and we would really appreciate if you just take a moment and share your feedback with us. It helps us to improve our webinars um, in the future. And once again, please call Patient Central, our call center, and speak to a trained case manager with any questions that you have about your care and treatment or any follow-up questions that you have from the webinar today. The phone number and the email are on the screen in front of you. And finally, I just wanted to encourage everyone to join us um, next Monday, June 15th at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time for a webinar to kick off our annual Advocacy Action Week. Normally, we would be in Washington, D.C. in person, but of course, this year, we'll be doing these activities virtually, which allows for many more people to, 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 be, to be with us and participate. So we hope you'll join us. The webinar will feature Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, a longtime champion for pancreatic cancer research, Honor Bon Mitra, a leading pancreatic cancer researcher from MD Anderson, and other special guests. You can register at pancan.org backslash advocacy week.
So we hope you will join us. Thank you again for your participation today. Thank you again, Dr. Lowy and Dr. Tempero. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe and be well. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, everyone.